Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm the East of the Forest. This week we have part two of the David Holiday experience, and I think you're going to enjoy this part more as he gets even more vulnerable and deeper as uh, we kept coming to the end of the podcast. He had more he wanted to share. And I broke it up into two parts because they kind of felt like two parts and it's a little easier to digest. But man, I'm really grateful that we could have this opportunity to uh, from hear from him. So here it is. I know you're going to enjoy it. Before we get into that, just a quick announcement. I wanted to let you know that we have something very, very exciting to announce. Um, we've been working hard in the background to create a real world East Force ceremony experience in the Salt Lake City area this winter. And today you can go to eastforce.org slash tour and you'll see some more information about the event. The reason we haven't announced a specific date and location is because it's sort of like a pledge system where you can show that you're interested and that you would like to go. And this is a fully compliant COVID safe with all the guidelines. We exceed the guidelines actually so that you can come and have a, a safe physical experience but still be able to gather together in a way that we can do what we do in the East Forest Ceremony Concert Series, which is to dive deep into our inner landscape for rejuvenation, uh, for illumination, and for renewal. And we're going to need that more than ever as we move forward here. And so that was the intention behind this event. So check it out, and we'll give you more information as we can. But if you if you want to pledge that you'd be interested in coming, just there's no financial commitment to to that if it didn't happen or something. But go to eastforest.org slash tour and check out more about this uh, East Forest Ceremony event that we are offering. We're still down here in southern Utah. Rada made it down here a couple days ago. The weather has turned a little bit warmer, so we're very grateful to be able to get outside, especially with given everything that is going on. It's been a real respite. And we'll keep coming to you as we can keep coming to you. Uh, thank you for giving this podcast reviews for sharing it and for sending any messages of support to info at eastforest.org. Thanks to everybody who's gone over to the merch store has been purchasing the Spores LP on vinyl, which is in its first printing of 300. So a couple more of those left. We have the new Ramdas art prints that you can get, which are great for the holidays, perfume oils, pins, um, other goodies like that, including uh, the held vinyl and the old church vinyl is still has a couple of those left too. So, you might want to get an advance run on your shopping for the holidays. It's wonderful gifts. And I'm sorry for these commercials, but it's a great way to support um, the East Forest ecosystem in a time of the pandemic. And I appreciate you guys listening to the podcast and everything that you do do. Okay, let's get into this part two conversation with our dear friend, the modern caveman, David Holiday. Anything that separates me from other people, including my own way of being, I want to just leave it behind. And so somehow, like, uh, the Stone Age living is like the most base, basic form of yeah, being so a human being is like, gets you the closest, it in a seems sense, to who like you that, are. It seems like, that. like my mom said one day uh, when I was in my 30s and trying to be, you know, the single parent that she was worried about. And I'd go visit her and she goes, David, I'm afraid you're going to become a hermit. You need to interact with society. I said, Mom, when I'm working on a bus trip, I get to know people better in four days than you know all your neighbors on your block. Yeah, sure. But in a month, we've become family that's needed each other, dependent on each other, seen the worst and best of everybody out there and are in love with each other. So if anything, mom, I think I'm having a deeper life experience. The only sad part is they go away. I lose, I lose people I love every 30 days, mom. But it's not like we aren't. I'm not alone. I'm immersed in my, my just fast forwarding to right now, mm -hmm. my only wealth in life is all the people I love and that love and care for me and the connections I've made through human beings. That's the richest thing that I got going. I am time rich and I love and respect and admire thousands of people. 
Now, whether they come around or I even remember their names isn't even important to me. I'm not a businessman that has to memorize a thousand names so I can make a sale. I don't think I remembered your name for like a long time when it, I, I, but I know who you are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know it's Trevor now, but for a long time, I'm like, you're the guy who does that music in the Cylon. <laughs> you're where people are going to like lay on their backs and feel things. <laughs> right. So I knew who you, I know what you were doing, but I'm not this person who, who is very good at all those socially acceptable behaviors of remembering the important stuff in terms of, you know, the car you drive, the clothing you wear. That's your, how people remember people here. Your, it's your the car birth, you drive. your birth yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. You know, but if I could make up nicknames for lots of people, I think I could come up with some pretty good ones. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, I'm not apologizing for that behavior, but I'm kind of, I feel it often that the important stuff is sometimes being buried and that we're not connecting. And so I loved my years as a Boulder Outdoor Survival School instructor. And it wasn't like I want to go back to my glory days, but I'd, I'd, I'd do it right now. If somebody walked in and said, hey, I just got a phone call. Do you want to do a trip? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, I, My I, body still works and I can still get it done. I've know? been hiking with you and we're just supposed to be going out for a couple hours for fun. And you're always like, hey, you know, if we want to just... Stay. We have nothing with us besides maybe a bottle of water, and uh, you usually have nothing. And you're you're down. You're down to just keep going. And that's a that's a wild thought for most, pretty much everybody. Okay, and it it might look casual and maybe irresponsible. Well, you have a lot of experience too. But I didn't start acting like that till I could actually tested it. That it. I mean, I didn't start off like that. Okay. Sure. Sure. My dad was a Marine Corps Colonel. We were completely outfitted when we went on any expedition, and he called us men from the day we were born till still di- till he died. All right, men. And so we had all the stuff, and I think it was that security. I mean, I have a lot of theories about this. I think the more secure you are in certain parts of your life, the more you can let go. When you're insecure, you can't let go of anything. When you are secure, when you can let go, or you, you can you let, should let go, or no, you can. You can. You can. You're and able you're, to because you know when somebody tells you, "Keep," you know, I know that's your soda pop, but you're supposed to share. Mm-hmm. Then it's never yours. An authority figure is telling you you got to take half your soda pop and give it to your brother. Mm-hmm. But what if you could say no? Then when you finally do share, it's because it's yours, and you can give it to your brother. You don't have to give it, or you're going to get in trouble. It is your soda pop. So I say, when you're really secure and what you have is yours, you can give it away. But when you're told that nothing you have is yours or that we don't have enough or that you grow up afraid in the out of doors, my dad taught us how to all just be really happy and so did my mother in the out of doors. What was the base of that, the baseline? We're always totally prepared. We had everything. Okay, so had to do it. We weren't like... I wouldn't call us maximalists, but we weren't minimalists. We had stuff. Mm-hmm. And we knew that he fought in two wars and that my mom grew up a cowgirl with horses. Mm-hmm. So we, we just were happy out there. And so were my grand, all my grandparents on both sides were just pioneers that just knew how to be happy on the land. But we always ate good. We always slept good. And we had the stuff. But, not, but, but you evolved into not wanting to have the stuff. Well, here's a theory. Check, the, check this out. Think of the people in our history that were able to totally let go. They say Buddha grew up pretty wealthy. They say a lot of Hindu important people were wealthy. The story about Jesus being poor is bogus. His dad was the carpenter on the temple that was being built for Herod. He was a very wealthy man. Jesus had a purple robe because he really was related and was in line for being the traditional Jewish king. You don't get those seamless purple robes by going and buying one. You you are given that at birth. So Jesus was a rich kid who let go of everything to become this guy who didn't have a house and wandered around with his 12 buddies. So that's the fast version. But if you look in history really close, that story about him being poor in the manger, 
That's because there was no place to stay, but not because the family didn't have the cash to pay for a room. So you see it as like a path to enlightenment in a way? All I'm saying is, my, yeah, my de- Martin Luther King had a good education by parents that had good educations, and he grew up in a really secure Atlanta neighborhood. And when they told him they're going to kill him if he stands up for his people when he goes to that thing in Chicago, not only did his faith allow him to let go, but his upbringing, he, he wasn't scratching for a dollar. He wasn't scratching for a life. He had a good life. He was able to let go of that because he wasn't aching for the next, you know, raise or the money or the car. So I'm saying I grew up pretty happy and secure because we were on camping trips every time every time my dad was a construction guy every time he got some extra cash he did one house at a time so he could split for the woods or Mexico or Guatemala anywhere but he worked hard made his money honestly didn't screw anybody didn't jerk anybody around just worked hard saved his money and then went on camping trips with his family so I think that I was able to like let go of all the stuff because I had I had a full Marine Corps outfit when I was four, the backpack, the camouflage, everything, and then I wanted to be a sailor, so they went to the Army surplus and bought me a kid sized sailor suit, and then I wanted to be Davy Crockett, so I got me a Davy Crockett outfit. I got to play and pretend. I think I was Pancho Villa for a lot of years. I had the stuff, you know. So on Halloween or Rodeo Day, I always dressed up. You know, with all this stuff. And so I think having five older brothers, a mom who was an outdoorsy, happy lady, and a dad, whenever we went into the wild, I thought I was going out to be to a place that was way better than home. And like I said, we always, we, we always left when we had time. So our summers were always out in Oak Creek Canyon, someplace up above Sedona, when it, back when it was wild and free and no people. Uh, and Sedona wasn't what it is today, just a little town with one store. Uh, we lived in Guatemala. We went camped out in all 32 states of Mexico when I was little. And I was always wondering, like I said, constantly, wherever I went, who lived, <coughs> who lived here before us and how did they make a living here? That was on my mind everywhere I went. Yeah, I can tell there was an aching in you uh-huh. to return to that, and that's so, part of your bones. So I, but, letting go of the gear was easy, but I didn't do it all at once. Like but I, but, but yeah. the motivation yeah. was, was from, and then you I saw learned, that as a path. I learned the skills, and then the uh, older I got, the more I was able to just say, well, let's go test this. And so by the time I was 50, I had been traveling between Idaho and... And northern Mexico so many times in so many ways that one day it just hit me. I bet I could walk from the Mexican border to here off trail, off map, and not know where my next water supply was and still make it. Because I'd worked in all that area for so many years with youth rehab programs and flown over it in a plane and driven in a car all directions. I'm like, I know where the mountains are. I know what names they are. I know where they are from water sources. I'm going to try this. And so I walked from Mexico to Rainbow to Utah to Rainbow Bridge. Uh, what time of year? The first time I did it was in uh, May, Ju- Ju- May, May, June. And then I made it as far as uh, San Francisco. Pe- I made it from the Mexican border to the San Francisco peaks uh, without walking the Arizona Trail. I left the trail early on sometime right after I left the Mexican border. Ran across it a couple of times, but it didn't go where I wanted to go. And then from there, I went up to the Navajo Res, all the way to Rainbow Bridge. But all I'm saying is I didn't do that when I was young, when I wanted to. I did it when I was 50, after I knew you built up the it. land. Yeah. And so I, that when you said you know that I could just go off without anything, it's because I've done it a lot. Oh, I knew that. Well, all I'm saying is also though that it's it's that I didn't start acting that way till I till I knew how. Yeah, that's not cavalier. It, and and there's a lot of people who want to act cavalier and look cool, and I'm like, that's dangerous. That'll kill you. Mm-hmm. Or or you'll have an amazing experience and know what not to ever do again. <laughs> yeah. Which I had a lot of those too. And I keep forgetting that that we're here to talk about me. You keep asking, so I don't want to be talking about me. 
But I, if this podcast is supposed to be about my story, yes, I finally got to do my Stone Age month. And it went from the 16th of August to the 16th of September. September. And I'd done a Stone Age three months before when I was a young single parent and I was in my late 20s. But the difference is I had the strength to do it then and I have the knowledge to do it now. If I would love to know what I know now and then be able to go try it with a 20-year-old body because I could move and I could get where I needed to go. I just didn't know what to do. And now that I know what to do, my body still functions, but I can't cover as much ground, and our earth is diminishing. There's not as much food as there was when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Lots of things have changed, and so you got to cover... Hunter-gatherers need to cover ground anyway, but you got to cover a lot more ground, and that means you're using more energy, and there's a lot less food out there now. There was no grasshoppers this year. This is the driest year in the recorded history of, of Utah. The water holes are empty. The animals have all gone to town to eat like dogs, cats, or, or alfalfa or whatever he, farmers do. The most plant-rich areas are agricultural areas now, not na natural areas in the West right now. So all the wildlife's going to town. So... I mean, I love fish and grasshoppers, and there's a pretty good crop of fish this year, but there was no grasshoppers at all. And grasshoppers are like the sure deal food of the animal kingdom, and they're delicious. <laughs> but there was, I might have had four this year, and then a six or seven trout. But the plant kingdom is my forte. It's my love. Mm -hmm. I love my plant friends, and they're not doing so well this year. So it was a hard year, but your stomach gets small. Everything you eat is delicious when you're hungry and you don't need much. And after a while, I, w I didn't need to eat much. And my wife planted a lot of squash and a lot of uh, un uh, chives and onions and tomatoes and, ch and chilies. And so I could use my Stone Age process to walk over to the garden and eat. I, I said stealing was okay, raiding. And so... I asked Kevin Gardner if I could raid some corn out of his uh, field, and I did. <laughs> and so I got to I got to eat a lot of acorns. Uh, whenever I'd go to town, I had to walk. That's when you saw me. Yeah, walking I ran back. into you on the road. Uh, I only went to town once, and that was to go to church. And then I walked to the Kiva Coffee House because I was supposed to end my adventure by walking to the. So I didn't really go. I was going to go to church every Sunday, and I got so many people showing up to learn from me that I just started like thinking how hard it was to start on a Saturday afternoon, walk into town, stay at the Ryan's because I could raid, I raid their blackberry patch with permission mm -hmm. and pick blackberries for them and ate a lot of food out of their garden. So I got to have uh, a lot of food that was raised by other people. Uh, I call it Apache style garden and you sit in the hills and watch them work and then you raid it at night. <laughs> but the truth was I had permission. I, I didn't really steal, but uh, I didn't allow myself as much hunter gatherer time as I wanted because I had so many students. And I told my students, if I teach all day and can't go out and do what I need to do to take care of myself, you need to compensate me with something to eat. Yeah. So, so I used my mouth to eat. Yes. I talked and then they gave me and taught classes. So after going through that and what you've gone through and the changes you've seen, uh, I just wanted to last, the last question is to ask you about how you're witnessing this, all this change we're all going through and how you view it or if you're hopeful. Yeah, I am hopeful. Not based on just wanting things to be okay. Uh, a lot of what I'm hopeful or comes out of plate tectonics and knowledge of the geologic record of planet Earth and how it's really, really destroyed itself many times on its own energy without humans involved at all and that this cycle happens. So that takes the edge off of us being the bad people who are going to wreck this place because we are weaklings when it comes to wrecking this place. We we can't do it. We don't have the power to do it. We can harm our surroundings and we can harm ourselves, but it's nowhere near permanent. And we are way down the list 
of things that have destroyed the surface of this planet for life forms over and over again. But plate tectonics is one of them, meaning that everything gets sucked under and then put, spit back out in either a less or more toxic pattern than we've ever been able to dream about doing ourselves. Another one is the, the geological record. I learned that there are, there are lead deposits that are 11 foot thick that, that cover 500 square miles all over. And that lead is the end result of highly radioactive. When, when the half-life keeps not having any more half-life on a highly radioactive zone, when it's done and finished, that's why radioactivity can't pass through lead because it used to be that and then it's not anymore. So it's the all done with radioactivity material on planet Earth is lead. There are 11 foot thick layers that are five or 600 miles across that go on all over all, lots of places on the planet. What highly radioactive event left those 11 foot thick lead deposits? So little stuff like that got me to feel like, oh, the baseline is that things happen. So when you say you're hopeful, it's less about like humanity. Well, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting there. I got long answers. I apologize, but maybe I, don't, maybe I shouldn't. But, uh, and then another thing is anthropology. Hearing the stories of all the peoples of the earth, not just my little neighborhood, not just my country, not just the rich college version of all the countries that have made colleges and education and modern style stories, but I'm talking about all the people who have nothing to do with our modern way, all the way to the highest science of our way. There's lots of stories about there, about all over the planet, about losing it and regenerating life over and over again, and about coming from other places that aren't even this planet and reestablishing really beautiful, healthy gardens of life. Those are stories told in, in myths all across the over. globe. All over the place. Coming from other planets. All, and it, oh, and yeah. And so, uh, and then sometimes just coming from some other island or from some other continent, but just reestablishing. And then all the way to the current, I know places where there used to be highways in the 60s and 50s and 70s that you can't even, or talk about paved highways are gone now. And that's without big machinery ripping them out. I know places that were just devastated in the 70s that are jungle-like now with no human interaction, not because they pulled the cattle, not because some government agent made a plan, just because the earth regenerates, even in our weird times. And then even more recently, there's a group of people up north, way up north, that say they started noticing that there's a wobble that mm -hmm. they're noticing a wobble and they're like, whoa. And then I heard this might be total hearsay. It might just fit my favorite story that life is good and that we can make it better, but that it's going to be good or bad on its own terms with, with or without us, but that the earth responds to us. And if we love it, it actually takes care of us. Now that's a hard to believe thing for a lot of people. But when the COVID hit and everything slowed down, they started reporting that the wobble went away. Now, if this hurts your sensibilities, and I call our Earth mother, mom, when her kids slowed down, she relaxed for a little bit. The tension dropped. So as our internal tension was up, we actually stopped moving around so much and looking for a dollar bill and just stayed home. Mm -hmm. It got really quiet and happy in my world as soon as the COVID hit. Because everybody stayed home all over, all over our country. And there was a type of peace that I haven't felt for ages. Like I'd have to go back to times in the 70s or 80s when there was nobody around this part of the world at all, hardly, just a few old people working hard, gardening and being slow. No party and no, no get someplace in a, in a hurry. It felt like that. Boulder didn't have traffic on every back street trying yeah. to get to work. It felt just like it did when a car went by every three hours instead of every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, if that was happening all over, these people are saying that the wobble stopped for a while. And I thought to myself, if we just go back to business as usual without really stopping to slow down and really take care of the important things in our life, 
then we're as dumb as we're, uh, we're as, we deserve whatever's coming next. The COVID's, the COVID is nothing compared to things that have happened and things that are coming our way. And if we don't learn a good lesson from this one, we deserve whatever's coming next as a species. If we don't really start taking care of the place, we're going to get thwacked. That's what happens. That's just normal. You keep peeing in your water and pooping in your water, poisoning your air in your water over and over again. Eventually, it's like an organism like yeasts that are making wine. They eventually crap on themselves so much that they become a static, non-living, drinkable drink. So if our planet was like a little wine bottle, we're getting to the edge where the, we got nothing left for the yeast to eat. And maybe somebody else is going to collect us and drink us up <laughs> later on. But right now, we can't keep doing what we've been doing. We'll be the petroleum we'll, oil for we'll, a million for, years. For somebody later. Later. <laughs> yeah. We'll be the gasoline yeah. for the... But, but there's yeah. been... <laughs> story after story that, did you know, that, I'll, I'll end with this one. This is a positive story that's beautiful to me. And I'll preface it with the Hopis and lots of other people say that this will be the fourth time that we've wrecked the place by thinking technology is more important than living correctly on the planet. Like living on the earth's terms, we want to live in our terms. And so we do what we want and it wrecks th the planet. For people. They'll say this is the fourth time we've done that if we do that, if we choose that path, which we are choosing right now. So, But so do lots of other tribal peoples all over the planet. They have longer memories than we do. They're thousands of years old. We're like, this whole thing's an 80-year experiment at the max, maybe a hundred something. It depends on when you want to go back to when we made our first big diversion. But that's different per person and different per culture. So I'm not going to give a time period, but I think this this current thing we're experiment we're trying feels like it's about 80 years old to me about 80 to 80 to 90 years old. When I listen to my grandparents' stories compared to how we're living now, this fast-paced stupid move we're making now isn't that old. This this experiment is brand new. Mm -hmm. So, the Hopis and lots of other people, I keep using them cuz they they're most verbal about, you know, to everybody around here, we're southwesterners. They say that they've already been higher technologically advanced three times. Three and then we times. kept picking the wrong path and destroying ourselves. This is the fourth time that they know of in their history. And then there's Hindus who might have one that goes back way farther. Like this might be a... But all of them say that this is happening all over the universe and that all the beings are getting a chance to learn how to be by having an opportunity to learn how not to be. It's, we're allowed the freedom of choice to make as many mistakes as we want because it's the best educational pattern. Being forced to do the right thing or being forced to do the wrong thing doesn't help us learn. So we're here to learn more than we are to save the planet. And that's a funny statement. The, the, the Nazis were into saving the planet and so were the Aztecs. They would kill up to 25,000 people by cutting their hearts out and get the sun to come up. But they were saving the planet. So people who will kill everybody to save the planet, they're not my team. I'd rather, I'd rather be allowed to be as dumb and make as many mistakes as I want and then be nudged and taught and gently told, here's a better way, and then find that out for myself. But to have somebody just cut my heart out so the sun will come up, that has the power to tell me that I've got to do this or the people won't make it. I think that's a lie. I think there were lots of people who knew that was a lie then. And there's a lot of people right now who know that to start modifying everybody's behavior with a pistol at your head isn't going to work. Well, it's, the, heart, it's heartbreaking. It's for, heartbreaking. For people who feel like they feel their own inner truth, like we're talking about, right? we can see it clear as day. You can make the individual choices, but it's really this collective energy. And, and it pisses energy. me off that I have to dial right along with the rest of them when I'm not doing the same thing. I, if I completely do the right thing, I'm still going to get to have the bomb drop on my head just like my neighbor, no matter how yeah. good I have been. You're a caveman born into uh, iPhone times. Right. So, so to finish all this off, I'll just say that there's a group of people in Africa in terms of my hope 
There's a group of people in Africa that speak the oldest. Linguists say it's the oldest language on planet Earth. And some anthropologists in the 40s and 50s were talking to them. They said, where do you come from? And they have a very similar story to lots of other people's. They say, they pointed at the Pleiades, and they say, we come through the middle of that. We came here through the middle of that. And these are Stone Age African people who aren't living a fancy life. They, well, and, and the anthropologists laughed because they were shown a map that was woven out of a cane that you could and reeds, and so you could hold it up, and you could look at the stars through this thing, and it would have the openings for them. But it was backwards. And they said, what's wrong with your map? It's backwards. And they said, no, it's the one we used to get here. <laughs> it's from the <laughs> other side. <laughs> yeah. Like dummies. <laughs> so one group's looking at these people like, Aren't, isn't that a quaint belief, these funny little people that don't know the truth? Because we're scientists and we know. And these funny little people are laughing at them like, they're smart. Don't they know that you, 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 when you're looking at a map that's a see-through map and you're coming from the other direction, it's not backwards. It's the one we used to get her, dummies, right? So two hugely pers different perspectives on being on planet Earth and where we come from. So, And where we're going, perhaps? I believe, I believe that some of our seeds, just like Neil Young says, is our, our silver seeds are going to make it someplace. Uh, but what I disagree with is the idea that we're going to trash this place because we got someplace else to go. That is like, you know, telling your mom, I'm going to mess up my room and not brush my teeth and not wash the plates because we're just going to have to do it again later. And I'm like, no, nah, I think that the quality of life will always be better when you love not just the humans or not just the humans in your family, but count everybody the tree people, the rock people, the people people, the tree, you know, the, the, the plant people. And do you think that's a possible people? evolution for seven, eight, nine billion people? What, uh, you know, yeah, because just like I, my story about being, you know, Martin Luther King being secure, being able to let go of his life, Martin Luther King is not dead. They shot his body. So as a person who knows that I have more to me than just this physicality, that's a security that people who don't believe that will never, they'll sell out to the mafia or the CIA or anybody else to stay alive at all costs. You know, I know it's not right to kill Jews in the gas chamber, but they'll kill me or take my family away if I don't keep doing my job, sir. It's the cop who says, it's just my job. I know it's wrong, but I got to do it because I got to pay the bills, Right. But if you're willing to let go of all that and say, you know, I'd rather lose my job than do the wrong thing to you, sir. I'd rather get killed right along with you. I'd rather stand in line with you than live taking, vampiring your life so that I can be happy and do well. For a time. For yeah, a time. In my mind. Yeah. yeah. And so to me, it's easier to let go when you know this isn't it. When you know that humans are sentient beings, whatever, however you want to call them, thinking, feeling beings that look similar to us, no matter what color they are, what shape their ears are. It might be like a Star Wars bar, but there's a bunch of beings out there in the universe who are gaining clarity and understanding or they're losing clarity and understanding because of the choices they're making and that's been going on forever in this educational system. So, so to get real with you, like about who I am, you can, you know, you'll know how crazy I am after this. You can cut me to pieces. <laughs> this really might be the graduating class of a certain year that used, a certain set of years that used the planet. And that we might not be related to lots of other groups that used this place before. And so our type of human, no matter what color we are, we might have basically come from a group that arrived here not that long ago. You could have some born-again Christian who's telling you that the 
Earth's only 7,000 years old. And I can say, well, maybe we've only been here for 7,000 years. Because some big changes happened between the mammoth hunters and the next group of pyramid builders. There's these big, huge gaps. Huge gaps. And they can't put them together genetically or any other way. They just have a story that they're trying to make fit. Mm-hmm. They keep trying to make stories fit that somebody came up with in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and they can't find the evidence to support it. But people all over the place are saying, well, maybe we need to take a broader view of who we are. Maybe we are visitors and newcomers, and maybe the reason we don't get along well here is because we haven't settled in very well, some of us. (laughs) We're still trying to be the person who gets everything they need regardless of the effects on the environment around them. But so you start speaking to like two, in a sense, like star people versus uh, non-star people in a sense. Maybe some people adapted really well and are looking pretty poor uh, and, and out of power. And then some people are looking pretty powerful, but really, I mean, here's what I, I'm going to, I'm going to stop because I, I'll just say this. I bet I could take Idi Amin, Hitler, Donald Trump and Hillary and everybody on a long, long outdoor survival trip. Yeah. And I would end up seeing the worst and best of each one of their characters, but I bet you they would all learn how to be friends and need each other if they would slow down and start doing what it takes just to get through the thing alive together. I have seen the best of so many people because I was with them long enough in a hardship situation where they had to start digging deep. So I am rich. So maybe they weren't all great folks. But they were when they were with me. And I'm not saying it was me. I mean, it's because what we were doing. The stage is set. And in some ways, yes. the, the humanity is, is when you strip away yes. the clothing that's fogging everything else. But that said, everybody volunteered to be there most of the time. Mm-hmm. But for they nine months. it. But, but nine months out of the year, I was working with youth rehabilitation programs of people who hated me for representing the man because their parents sent them there and they couldn't yell at their parents. So I was the biggest scumbag on the planet. They hated my guts and I represented all the powers that are oppressing them because they got sent on an outdoor program. So I still know that I've seen growth and beauty come out of angry, nasty, little mean punks. That wasn't who they really were, but that's what they were trying to show me because they're, F you, if you're going to make me eat this and whatever, whatever, whatever. Six months, no, six weeks later, sometimes six months later, there are these happy people who are having a good time going, hey, you know, when I get back, I'm going to tell my mom that I'm sorry because I, I really love my mom. I, I didn't realize how much work they had to do because like out here, I'm having to eat this and cook for myself and keep myself clean. And it's really a lot of work. And I didn't realize how much labor it takes just to get through the day. And my parents have been doing that for me my whole life. I didn't know that. So you get these big, what they call epiphanies or uh, awakenings when you're out long enough to know, wow, we are so, so blessed with the amount of food and clothing. And, you know, even on those survival trips, we're actually eating better and have more stuff than some of the poorest people on the planet right now that don't know if they're going to eat at all, can't find a clean drink of water, and are, don't have any clothes that cover them up. So we chose it, and that's what makes it fun, is we get to let go of everything and go see who we are without all the stuff. But when you don't have a choice... I bet you the I bet you the party's over. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't wait. Like I'll end here. I said I was going to end. The happiest day after my Stone Age month is I couldn't wait to put a, put a pair of shoes on. Mm-hmm. It felt so good to put some socks and shoes on and sit in a car and travel with without walking. Listen to music. Mm-hmm. On the radio. Mm-hmm. Listen to the Navajo KTNN station from from Window Rock and to- Tohatchi and just have a fun kind of modern experience. In fact, that's what I want to go do. I, after that, I feel like I put all a lot of my uh, things that I made, 
in the museum here in Boulder so that it can enrich the experience of the people who go look in the displays in that little room they have in there, the, what was Pueblo in life look, what, was, what it looked like. I put a lot of my stuff for my Stone Age month in there because I, I don't want it anymore. Mm-hmm. I, maybe I want to be a cowboy next or a, <laughs> a, a mountain man. Maybe I want to get a rifle. I, I, I don't want a bow and arrow anymore, and I don't want a really? atlatl. Mm-hmm. Those, I, I felt like I, I, I let go of something that I, I don't have to be a caveman anymore. I, 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 it wasn't the full experience, but I got 18 years of teaching it and living it for four or five months out of the year. So I got a lot of years doing it, but this was like my final, like, huh, Unless somebody comes and asks me to show them stuff and do it with them, which was fun, but it's about the people, not about the activity. Well, you said you lived six lives, so I think this is now your seventh chapter arriving. I, yeah, I, I, it feels like I want to take that foundation of being able to feel secure and happy, and I don't care if I get, if, you know, if I got called on a mission, like to downtown L.A. to live in the alleys with drunks or whatever, or had to go sit in like have seminars at at Denny's or whatever or big you know it would get fancy somebody could say I need to go hang out with Donald Trump in his office for a week or Hillary or Obama or I don't care who it was I don't care what political party if they said I needed to go to Washington and I was going to be useful somehow and hang out in their environment I would go as long as I knew I belonged there and that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing and that, so I don't think the, like, this is a pretty hoity toity space right here. We're sitting this in right studio, now. This studio, it is indeed. Yeah. It is indeed. And there's yeah. a bar right next door, you know, that's. Let's give a shout out to pretty, the, Bo- the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch. Bingo. Uh, yeah, thank you. Ron, you know, Ron and Brandy and their crew and Eric and Ava, their cooks. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Sweetwater Kitchen. It's so sweet. There's so much what I would call opulence here. Without the hoity-toity attitude of the owners, there's all the all the opportunity to look like you're trying to be cool, but they're just trying to do something well, yeah, and make it useful so they can bless the most people with this space. And I've been the beneficiary of that so many times because of things that pe- programs people put on here. And them hiring me to come do the nature component of that. Yeah, loved having you at the retreats. Bingo. You know, I don't feel a resistance. There's a lot of people when you try to tell them we're all going to go like be silent for an hour and lay on our backs and and breathe and smell things. They're kind of like, what? We're going to take our shoes off? When I come here, the people that that you introduced me to and the other folks introduced me to here, they're all like, yeah. Well, I was doing that all last week, but I'd love to do it with you. Yeah. It's not like a big new thing. Yeah. I'm always looking for these ways of getting people to connect. And around here, I, I might be passe. You know, I might be just this old man who's still talking 80s and 90s experiential education process when they've already been to Mars and back and wondering why I'm so slow, you know? I don't think so. When, when are you going to? When are you going to get it, Holiday? You know, I think so. the slowness is is what is sort of like the kryptonite today. So it's sort of interesting. I believe that the best medicine we could have is for all of us to quit going so fast and and it's so hard trying to get something. And it's you get you get too many pigs at a trough and they all think they're going to starve to death. Yeah, it's I, a mechanism for getting them to overeat. I feel that myself. And so, so I feel like we're over over. We're exaggerating our movements and everything else because there's too many rats in a cage and it's a type of insanity. And that's why this part of the world is really healthy for so many people. They need to get someplace where they're not looking. I mean, that's a whole other subject and I should probably not go on. But I I just want to say we are designed to take in information and to receive. And we're at a time period where we're having to go against our natural selves to survive. You walk down a street with thousands of people and thousands of advertisements, and you're trying to shut things out when we we're actually designed to take things in. So part of our insanity is as we feel like we have to shut information out to survive, and we weren't designed for that. We're designed to take it in. So learning how to just put your head down and not look at anybody, not smile, not say hi, is the antithesis of being a human being. And so we're getting very unhealthy. 
because we're thinking to survive, we've got to shut out yeah. people and, and, and information and get picky about what we take in and what we don't take in. And that, I think, is making us go crazy as a species right now. So people who can take it all in and not have it harm them, or at least have a filter that doesn't automatically just shut everything out, but maybe just let it bounce off and look at it as it bounces, but don't just ignore it like it's not there. Because when, when, a, when, a, when a tribal person that lives in a small village goes to New York City, you know what they always say? that they saw people that weren't eating on a corner and nobody stopped to give them any food. They couldn't imagine that. They couldn't imagine walking by somebody and not sharing your food with them because they would never do that in their world. So it's, you know, so it takes living there for a while to get jaded enough or, you know, you have to just get to where you don't want to notice it because it's not your business. It's, it's not your problem. It's not my problem. Or there's too much, or just yeah, too yeah. yeah. So you can't solve it. It's so like why a, try? A ocean. Yeah. It's a, right. You can't solve it. So why try? So I think we weren't designed to be in that huge of a cage full of that many rats. Yeah. There's an there's a, there's an intelligent part of us that doesn't get to display itself because it's overwhelmed. And I'd rather be underwhelmed and look for adventure <laughs> than trying to stay away from adventure every day. Am I going to get shot trying to go buy some cigarettes on the corner, you know? So I learned early, way when I was a little kid, that I'm happier in the wild than I am in town. And that's a good place to quit probably right there. Well, I can't thank you enough for your generosity of your time. And I've loved this. So thank you for uh, diving in. Maybe we'll do it again if I bump into you in the woods and I drag you into a studio. I love you, man. <laughs> love you too, brother. I love you. And... And this doesn't feel out of place. This this environment right here, I the first thing I want to do is like come back here with Juan, my son, and like play yeah. music or Juan Holiday. Could, let's yeah, let's record. Check him out on Spotify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to play music with you or add something to your yeah mixes that you do. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I love you, and I love the people you've introduced me to, and I love Ron and Brandy, and you know. There's a lot of people in this little town that don't hang out with each other. And I like them all, even the ones that talk bad about me, because I know that they don't know the truth. They, mm. The people that lie, <laughs> the people that lie for political gain or social power, I feel sorry for them, but I don't hate them. I'm more like, wow, you don't even know me. You should, you, we should spend some t We should go on a trip together <laughs> out in the wild for a long time and depend on each other and see the beauty in each other. And then, and then if you have something to complain about, come tell me about it. But I'd like to see our little community start letting each other be ourselves and, and quit talking about each other behind it. Because you don't, you don't, yeah. you're not in the loop yet. But I've heard some stories, like the joke around here, you got to go to the post office to hear what you've been doing lately. Mm -hmm. There's so many bizarre stories about people, and I know they're not true about me, so I wonder how much of the rest of it is way off. Sure. Way off. What advantage is that to us? That is not an advantage. That is, that is, that's another one of those separations. I stay away from things that separate me from others. And so I've got to not be part of that loop. It's an analogy for the world. It is right now. Because and, and it's getting more and more yeah. that way as people start saying, well, you know, I heard so much crap on every president we've had since Kennedy that like, oh, well, then everybody's evil. We're all evil, so let's just be evil. Let's be vampires. So anyway, I don't want to do that. I want to no. be the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And you don't have a website or even a phone, so nope. it's not like I can say, hey, check them out on Instagram. How beautiful is that? Um, so uh, don't try to find you, but people do. So. Yeah, I'm not looking for work. No, um, don't don't worry about it. I don't it, look man. for arrowheads, they find me. Yeah. And I don't look for work, work finds me. Yeah. I'm already working. I'm already busy doing something meaningful and beautiful every day, left to my own devices, whether it makes money or not, it's a whole other thing. 
yeah. but people always say, hey, is there any work in Boulder? Oh, yeah. There's no pay, but there's <laughs> lots of work. I meet Mexicans, you know, like, are there... I. Hay, hay mucho trabajo en el norte. Yeah, sí. Hay mucho trabajo. There's a lot of work. Uh, but where I live, there's no pay. If you want to, if you want to chase cows all day, there's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you get paid for that. Yeah. You can work in. You can irrigate alfalfa. You can work in the Hell's Backbone uh, garden. But mostly, it's eating and loving people and. Uh, and land. And land. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. as far as the human element here, it's sleeping well and eating well and drinking good water and breathing good air. But I think we're in the 10th poorest county in the United States of America as far as income, yeah. money income. But we live a much better quality of life. Aho. Aho. Thanks, David, so much. Uh, you know, I was putting out the show notes. It turns out someone has made a website for him. So you'll, you'll see that in the show notes if you want to dive into that. He still doesn't have a phone or email, and there's really no way to get in touch with him besides using Jedi forces and energies. But uh, you, can, you can learn more if you would like. This song you're hearing in the background is called Bloom. It is the first track off the Spores album. And the Spores album is now out wherever you listen to music. You can also get the vinyl at eastforest.org. Click on the music tab or the store tab, I should say. And you'll see all the different things that are in physical form that are available for purchase, including those new merch bundles that can give you some savings if you want to get a bundle of things. Uh, and go check out also when you're on the website, eastforest.org slash tour, and see if you want to learn more about the event that we're doing in Salt Lake City. Uh, this winter and see if that's something you want to join the community and be a part of uh, to help make it happen so our community can keep uh, diving in and walking our walk together on that note keep doing that don't take any shit but if you do friends do it with grace see you next week Yeah.